Oh, good morning, everyone. My name is Greg Kowser. Wow, I got a voice today. I just sound loud. Um, but welcome, welcome. Good to have you this morning. My name is Greg Kowser. I'm one of the pastors that's here. Uh, and I'm excited, really, uh, and in all seriousness, I'm excited about beginning uh, this fall series in the book of Ephesians. Uh, the book of Ephesians, for me, is familiar territory. Uh, I don't know uh, how many times I've read through the book of Ephesians. Uh, even for myself, how many times I've translated through the book of Ephesians and the different times that I've spent there. And I just got up this morning and, and uh, uh, I had done my uh, um, sermon preparation throughout the week. And today I just wanted to read the book of Ephesians and sit down and work my way through the book of Ephesians. And it is, it is a glorious set of truths. It is a wonderful journey to be reminded of who God is and what he's done, what he is doing, what he will do, uh, to be reminded of who I am. Uh, and what my purpose in life is uh, to get oriented and fresh. And I hope that that will be the case for us all along as we work through the book of Ephesians. Now, you'll notice, and I want to direct your attention to it here today, because I want to encourage you to make this a part of your every service as we go through the fall. This is the little uh, manual that we put together, a little study guide for the book of Ephesians. Uh, and this is one of those where we, we really have two major goals uh, over the course of this fall. Uh, we want to teach through the book of Ephesians and God's Word and work over it, but we also want to encourage good Bible study habits in our congregation, right? As uh, you and I uh, both know that there's, life is busy, right? It's just busy because if you have a phone, life is busy, all right? So all this stuff that keeps coming to you on your phone all the time uh, that you think that you need to pay attention to, life is busy. Uh, I even have to fight my own desire to get up at the first thing in the morning, turn my phone on, and look and see what's happened in the world. Uh, before I even turn to God and be reminded of who I am and really what's happening in the world, right? So all those type of things here, we're, we're trying to encourage you. And so we provided a tool that's going to take you through. Van's going to come and explain this tool and how it's going to function. I'm going to give you the introduction to the book of Ephesians today to give us an overview. And if you open uh, your little uh, uh, um, study guide here, you'll come and it says step one getting the big picture. I don't know if you can see that there, step one, getting the big picture. But that's where if you're studying any book in the Bible, whether it's Ephesians or Philippians or Matthew or Isaiah, Isaiah is really easy because it's short, uh, or you know, Philemon or any of those kind of things like that. We, we, what you need to do for any book before you start taking it apart on the individual level, right? So each book has its own organizing structure depending on what kind of writing it is. If it's a, an epistle, which we're going to look at in a letter, it's organized according to paragraphs. And you'll see that in most of your modern translations. We know how the book of Psalms is organized. It's organized by Psalm 1, Psalm 2, Psalm 3, and so you study individual Psalms. The book of Proverbs has individual statements. If you're reading uh, narratives or story books, right, like the uh, book of Genesis, it's organized by scenes and movement forward in a story. But in each one of those, when you go to study the parts or an individual story, like the story of Joseph within Genesis, to really understand the story, you need to understand it as a part of the bigger story of the book itself, right? Now, ultimately, we need to understand all the stories as a part of the big story of the Bible itself, right? But we're going to, the first thing we need to do if we're in Ephesians is you need to understand the book of Ephesians in light of the whole of what Paul is trying to accomplish. And this becomes especially important in the book of Ephesians because he's going to spend three chapters laying all the foundations for all of the direction in chapters four through six. And if you don't get the first three chapters, you can't really get the reason why and the resources for and the ultimate end of all of the things that he's asking you to do in chapters 4, 5, and 6. And so we're going to talk about that. And so today I want to give you an overview of the book of Ephesians. But I want to encourage you sometime during our study, as a matter of fact, I'd encourage you repeatedly. We're going to ask you every week to go through the portion that we're going to preach on the next week. But I would encourage you sometime during the study of the book of Ephesians that you just sit down and read the whole book without stopping. Right? Sit down and read it. And I want to even challenge you, don't listen to it on an audio app. Okay? Especially if the audio app is the background noise while you're mowing the grass. Right? Now, I would rather have you right, listen to the scriptures than to have some other cruddy thing on your iPhone while you're mowing the grass. That's okay. 
but, but to give your attention to something, and let me even encourage you, I would encourage you to go, and if you're not a person that likes to mark up your Bible, you like a pristine Bible, I don't know why you like that, but if you do, right, if you like a pristine Bible that's not touched, right, it looks like it's just crisp and everything when you open it, okay, fine, but then go to a place maybe like BibleGateway.com, uh, some of these resources are listed in your uh, thing, Print it out, and if you need help, print it out. I can print out one for you. We can figure out a way to print it out. But as you work through, just underline, circle things, write questions in the, in the margin, like, I don't understand what he's saying here. I really love this verse, right? All those kind of things like that. And as you begin to read, you're interacting with it, and your mind isn't drifting off everywhere else, right? Like it is when you're listening on audiobook, right? So I just want to encourage you. So I'm jumping in where... Ideally, I would have liked you to wrestle with it on your own for a while, but I'm going to give us an overview because we need to see the parts as a part of the whole. So we're going to talk about the book of Ephesians. So if you have your Bibles, which I hope you'll bring, and I would even encourage you, I know some of you love to bring it on uh, a digital form, that's okay, uh, but I would encourage you to bring it uh, in a written form as well so that you can uh, have it, you can mark it, you can do some things. Uh, I would rather have, in our church, um, Bibles turned over regularly because they're so uh, 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 marked up and so used that you can't read them anymore. I would rather have that happen than to have the best-looking Bibles laying around, right, that haven't been touched, right? Now, I'm saying that because I grew up in a tradition that discouraged writing in your Bibles, okay? And, and for, for a reason, it was the way this is God's sacred text. This is His Word, right? Well, uh, the question is, is, what does it really mean to honor it as God's sacred text? Is it to honor it by keeping your copy of it uh, as pristine as possible? Or is it to honor it by coming to love the Lord and obey the Lord of the Bible? And I think that's really where Scripture is taking us. So it's not an artifact to be kept in a case to be adored. It's, it's an introduction to the Lord who has saved you and delivered you in a call to life. Right? So whatever you need to do to engage it, I want to encourage you. Uh, to do that, right? Now, our kind of uh, subtitle here of what we're going to go after all the way through is we want to say that Ephesians is about uh, helping the, the people that he's writing to, the Apostle Paul, to enjoy, to understand and enjoy, and then proclaim God's triumph in Christ by the Spirit. Now, if we have done our job by the time we've worked through this, you will be able to explain that phrase about what, what did God triumph over? What triumph is it? What kind of triumph is it, right? And how is it accomplished in Christ? And how does the Spirit affect that triumph in the lives of individuals and in churches, right? So this idea, but I, I want to notice here is that idea of enjoy it. One of the things that, that Paul wants his readers to do is to get inside the wonder of what, it has, what, what has happened to them that Christ has set his affection on them, right? You know, I've mentioned this before, around campus where I am at Cedarville, every so often I'll have somebody, it's usually uh, uh, one of my daughters in the faith, one of the girls that I know on campus, they will come up to me and their eyes are bright and their face is bright and this has happened to me, it has to, has to happen you know, maybe a hundred times over the course of 20 some years that I've been there. And I'm still, I still don't get it. I, I still miss it half the time. But the person's coming up, they're bright. Usually the, the, they've got a guy standing next to them, right, that's there. And I know him too. And so they're sitting there and, uh, you know, Dr. Kowser. And I said, yeah, guess what? And I'm looking at him, what, what? And I should have known by looking at them. And then she sticks out her finger and goes, we got engaged, right? And boom, and then, you know, they're all excited and I'm excited for them. I don't know if I respond as excitedly as I should, but I respond, right? So, oh, I'm so excited for you. That's so great. And when, you, when that person's holding that ring out, they're not saying, you know, and if I ask them, right, sometimes it happens where I see the girl apart from her fiance and, and I'm talking to them and I said, well, who's, who's, the, who's the lucky guy, right? She never responds to me and goes, I don't care about him. Just look at this ring right? Look at this ring. Man, alive. Is that not a great ring or not? Right? No, she, sometimes I've seen some rings that are really impressive. I've seen some rings that are really unimpressive, right? In terms of that. But it's not the ring itself that the person is delighting in. They're delighting in the fact that that person loves me and that that ring is a symbol of that love. That's what they're delighting in, right? Because they admire, they love that person, and that person has freely given their affection to me, 
And I'm delighted in this ring because I'm delighted in him. And I think that the book of Ephesians is about saying, you need to grow in what it means that Christ has delighted in you. And that he does delight in you. And that he will always delight in you. And that given who Christ is and given who you are, that should overwhelm you with all. It should embolden your obedience. It should draw you to him in affection. It should make you run from whatever he says run from. And that's what the book of Ephesians is about. And so we're going to learn about prayer. We're going to learn about God. We're going to learn about our identity. We're going to learn about some of the most crucial issues that are facing us as a church in this moment. Paul is not going to back away from racial issues. And boy, did the early church have them. He's not going to back away from identity issues, one of the most crucial issues in this moment. Who are you, right? Uh, we used to think, and I just told my students as we began the school year, at least when I was in college, I didn't have to decide whether, what kind of being I was on the level of whether I was a man or a woman or some other construal of something. I could say confidently, I'm a man, right? Now, people could criticize what kind of man I was, but I didn't have to worry about uh, three or four or five or ten or a hundred other categories, Right? So that was settled. Now, what it meant for me to grow into, be a man, now that was something I had to figure out, but I didn't have to figure out. Matter of fact, when I went to the hospital, I didn't have to worry about getting a birth certificate back from the pediatric, American Pediatric Association that had no indicator of the sex of my children on them because they didn't want to prejudice their future identity choices. Right? Now, that's just been proposed. It's not been allowed. Certain states are allowing it, but it's been proposed by the American Pediatric Association that we should have birth certificates with no sexual designation on them because that prejudices are looked toward them. And, of course, that's something they need to figure out, whether they're a boy or a girl, as they grow up and what kind of being they are. Right? And so in this moment where people are cast about for those kinds of things, and it's hard to feel like if you just think you're a... a a woman in a woman's body, that you're, you're really outside the party, right? You're really one of the old stick in the muds that, that is a problem. And maybe you need to adopt some other more catchy identity like bi or something like that just so you can be a part of the party, right? So all those kinds of things that are going on in the moment and those pressures are on us in the way we talk to each other, the way we talk to our neighbors. They're on our kids in spades, Right? Among teenage girls, the, the, the largest growing identity is bisexual. That's the easiest way to get into the game without declaring yourself lesbian. But it's also, the, so I'm just, not, I'm just not settled, so I'm in the game too. Right? So I'm in the categories. So where we are, we need to think about who really tells us who we are. Really, who are we? Right? How do we live? What, how, should, how should we go about life? Right? And there are people who are suffering deeply. There are people who are enraged everywhere, right, where we are. How do we live as people who have a, a, an understanding of who we are and what God's mission is with a heart of compassion while we hold on to the truth for our sake and the sake of the people that we love, right? So I want to talk about all those things we work through the book of Ephesians. So enjoying and proclaiming God's triumph in Christ by the Spirit. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about Ephesians. Click me forward here, Steve. I do have it turned on, so I'm stuck here somewhere. It's coming. Got it? Oh, I got it. Uh-oh. I killed it. So I just clicked it and I killed it. Try one more? No. It is moving? Oh. oh, it's rebooting. Okay, all right. Well, here, let's just start off. I'll tell you what the first slide is. You can see it. Come to Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 1 and verse 2. Okay, let's start at the beginning. Uh, Paul begins all of his letters with what's called a greeting or a salutation. We don't use salutations anymore, right? Salutations and greetings, right? We don't say that. Uh, but this is what Paul says. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, to God's holy people in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, right? Now, when Paul's writing, Paul's not... Uh, creating some new type of writing uh, species called a letter, right? Like he's not creating some new Christian invention of a way to communicate to people. There are letters all over the place in the ancient world. Everybody writes letters. It's one of the ways to bring your presence to bear 
in a place you can't physically be, right? The same way that we try to do it. Now we have other avenues to do that, like emails and texts and Twitters, right? Twitters that we throw out in space to blast people and throw something out. But to bring our presence to bear someplace where we can't be, that's what a letter was, a technology to make that happen. And if you look back in the ancient world, there are tons of them. Matter of fact, we've dug up trash dumps full of letters. Uh, matter of fact, a letter that has been made the rounds, a first century letter because of the abortion discussion, is that in the first century world in which Paul lived, for example, uh, it was very common for uh, people to abandon their children. And so one of the famous letters, a first century letter from Egypt that's go been going around in recent days in the abortion discussion because it's been talking about how Christians responded in this first century world, was an Egyptian dad who was working uh, and he was separated from his wife and he's telling his wife that he loves her in a distance and she's pregnant and they don't know what the sex of the child is and he simply says to her, if it's a boy, keep it. If it's a girl, abandon it. That's his straightforward advice. Exposti is the Latin term for they would put them outside the city on the trash dumps. They would take these live babies, walk them outside the city and put them on the trash dumps. They wouldn't actually kill the babies right out. They would put them on the trash dumps. And the reason that they did is they would lay them out there and then the babies would either die or the babies would be picked up by other people and adopted or, or brought into the slave trade or made you know, sex slaves. It was dark, 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 dark. And the Christians distinguished themselves by going out and picking up those babies and adopting them, by going out and burying those babies that were left abandoned or, or caring for them as they died. And so in the first century world, he wrote a letter just simply telling his wife, you know, if you have a girl, we, don't, we can't afford her, we can't deal, just go take her out and put her out on the trash dump, but I hope it's a boy, right, in the ancient world. So Paul's not writing in a different form than anybody else, but if you open Paul's letter, you would have immediately recognized any first century reader. This is not a letter like any letter because he doesn't pray to any of the regular gods. There's no, there's no prayer to Serapis, which was a major god in Egypt. There's no prayer to Asclepius, the god of healing. There's no prayer to Diana or, or Artemis, which is the major goddess in, in Ephesus, right? So normally if you had somebody writing to Ephesus, they'd be speaking, you know, may, may Artemis give you long life. You know, we love Artemis, that kind of thing. Well, here Paul, he opens up and he calls himself, my title is an apostle, someone sent out by Jesus Christ. Well, that's a different group of people. And, then, and that, would, that title would hold no weight in the ancient world. Nobody would read that and go, oh, he's an apostle of Jesus Christ. There we go, apostle of Jesus Christ, what, what is that? Some of those crazy cult groups, right? But within the church, the, the church who understood that this is God's world that he's created, that Christ has stepped in to redeem and reclaim it in his life and death, right? To be one sent out by God was to be sent by the high king, to be sent by the authority of all authorities. And so he's one that, that should be listened to because he represents the God of the universe. And then you'll notice too, by the will of God, to God's holy people, they have an identity. They've been set apart, right? The holy, uh, the holy people is a sense that, that God has brought them to himself in a unique way. And by virtue of bringing them to himself, he set them apart from everything else. So this is a distinct group of people who call Jesus their Lord, and they look to God and the Father for the provision for life, and they look to him for wisdom, Right? This is a whole different way of imagining the world. As soon as you open the epistle, you're in a different way of imagining the world. And where you live, right, where we live in America, we have two different ways of imagining the world. Right? And, and they're vying for ascendancy today. There's the one as we imagine the world is that we're just accidents that exist in a world that has no purpose or reason. And I'm stuff. I'm interesting stuff. Right? I'm interesting stuff, I'm complex, but I'm really no more uh, sophisticated than a meatball, except with a little bit extra wiring. Right? So I'm an interesting meatball, but I'm here, and I'm here, and my life, right, to fit it here, is I, I'm, I'm, I got a little bit of time, and, and the, the idea is I need to look within myself to figure out who my authentic me is, and I need to bring that to surface if I'm going to really be an authentic person. And I need to stand over against any outside control that tries to give any boundaries to who I am. And if I can use technology to help me even realize those boundaries, like to change my anatomy, 
right, or to give me drugs to diminish who I am, I'm going to turn to that because the real goal of human existence is for me to be my authentic me. And the only people, right, that are bad are people who try to keep me from my authentic me and people who judge my authentic me. Because I, to, and this is a fragile state, right? I need to be who I am, but I also need the social world to affirm that I'm okay and this is good, right? Well, that's a way of imagining the world. That's who we are. And so how we live with our neighbor, to love my neighbor is to help them be their authentic self. And the last thing I want to do is have any kind of judgment, negative judgment about what they decide to be, right? And I certainly don't want them to feel bad about how they are because there isn't any boundaries that they need to observe for human flourishing, other than what they think they should, right? But on the other hand, is a vision of the world that, no, it's created. It has a design. It was made by God, right? He's ruling and reigning. He's actually involved in the world. And as a man, God created me as a man. He created some of you in here as women. And it's not only the fact that he created some man as a woman, but it's an assignment that he gave me. I didn't, get the, I didn't choose male or females. He gave me an assignment, and he wants me to live into my identity, which gives me certain potentials and certain limitations. And if I respect those, I'm going to know life. If I don't, it's going to bring destruction into my life and the people that I know about. And so he wants to bring me to life. And so that whole vision of life is a contrasting vision. Well, as soon as we open the book of Ephesians, we drop into a world that imagines the world as God created, as fallen and broken as uh, affected by dark forces in that it's a, we're in a battle as human beings against the darkness in ourselves and the darkness around us, and we can't be our own saviors. And we can't deliver ourselves. We can't uh, make ourselves into something that will deal with the deep sense of dislocatedness that we have, the deep sense of belonging that we want, or the sense of purpose. I can't find that through whatever identity I have, and I don't care how many people affirm that I can't get there apart from the intervention of Jesus. That's where we are in this world. And so he's trying to draw us into that world, and immediately he stakes his claim. So from here on out, what he's going to do in this book is he's going to help us imagine the world differently. Because what we find with the Ephesians themselves, they're coming from a pagan world where they imagine the world full of malevolent forces that are after them. And they live in fear, and they have to manage their life in the face of that. And Paul's saying, you're not seeing the world correctly, even though at the same time, Paul's not going to say there are no malevolent forces. So we'll come there. All right. Now, second, so move forward. Well, I'm still stuck, Steve. Just bump me one if you can. Oh, it's going to do it again. All right. Well, here's what the simple things that we're talking about here. Maybe God doesn't want, to, want me to use my PowerPoint today. I don't know. Um, but we're, we're about 60 AD. You want to think about time? And the reason I'm mentioning these things is because you need to be reminded that Paul is writing to real people in real places with real problems. Okay? Real people, real places with real problems. And he's writing to a city where Paul himself is in prison. Okay? Now, if you're, if you're thinking about this, why is it, how is it that God's purpose is moving forward without any uh, uh, halting or any deviation, even though his people are dying and imprisoned? Right? That's the issue he's going to come after. All right, see if we can go. All right, now, so Ephesus, and you probably can't read it there if you're like me. I can't see it real clearly from here. That thing's a little uh, out of adjustment. But I want you to look at Acts chapter 19 with me for a moment. Can you turn to Acts chapter 19 with me for a moment? What is up there is a little portion of the book of Acts. And one of the things about uh, the book of Ephesians is he's writing to a place that was renowned for the dark arts, right? I'm Harry Potter readers, right? Dark arts, okay, magic, okay? You can all own being a Harry Potter reader, it's okay. Just, we're taking names. Steve, you getting those names down? All right, Harry Potter reader. No, uh, Harry Potter reader, we read those in our home, and we read them out loud, we saw the movies, we did all those things, so if you want to take that up with me afterwards, we can do that. But uh, Harry Potter, uh, the dark arts, right? The, the dark arts. Um, but, but the dark arts, you know, they, they, they're, they're way before Harry Potter. This is something ancient, right? This is ancient as long as there have been uh, fallen human beings, right? Um, we're made to worship. We're made 
uh, for something beyond. Everybody looks for something transcendent, some outside, some power that you can draw on to actualize your human existence. And if you don't turn to God, you're going to turn somewhere else. In the biblical world, there's only two places to turn for spiritual power. Turn to God or you turn to the evil one, right? And one of the things that's true about Scripture all the way through is it never encourages us to poo-poo the reality of Satan or to say that, that we're not under threat from spiritual forces. This book, the book of Ephesians, has more to say about spiritual warfare than any text in the Bible. The only other place that it says uh, as much about spiritual warfare is in chronicling the life of Jesus and his interaction with demonic forces. That's the only place. But this book in particular talks about spiritual warfare. And if you're thinking about spiritual warfare and how to deal with it, Ephesians has to be one of the classic texts that you go to look at it. And so when you come to this book, in the backdrop in the book of, of, of Acts, you come to, look at verse 11 down here. Paul comes to Ephesus, right, as he's traveling as a, as a missionary. God did extraordinary miracles through Paul so that even handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched him were taken to the sick and their illnesses were cured and the evil spirits left them, right? Now, what's interesting here about Paul, if you follow Paul's missionary activities, everywhere he went, as far as I was concerned, it was pretty extraordinary, Right? People were being healed, things were going on, but Luke is the one who tells us when you get to Ephesus, Paul had a spiritual battle that broke out that was extraordinary, extraordinary. I mean, it was, it was, off, the, it was off the beam. It, it was a kind of encounter that Paul was, was fighting in a level, and in the ancient world, Ephesus was renowned for its magic arts. It was renowned as a center for magical power. There are even letters called the Ephesian grammata that were special symbols, right? In magic, you need special symbols to add to your spells to give them uh, um, power, right? To make them effective. Well, if you had the Ephesian grammata, you would want to have them around your life, around your home, around your spells because they added an extra oomph, right? To your ability to control the spiritual world. And so in, in Ephesus, Paul runs into a group of people that were impacted by it deeply, and it, and it reveals for us that in the ancient world, uh, magic was ubiquitous, right? And in the ancient world, uh, you, you largely felt that your life was controlled by uh, gods who were capricious, who really didn't care about you. You're caught up in a world that's infused with all kinds of gods, and they're busy doing all kinds of things. They have their own spheres of authority right over the sea, or sometimes they are, they're patrons of a given city, right? Or they're healing gods, those kinds of things. But they all have prescribed spheres of authority. And as a human actor, you're living your life, and these gods are busy doing their own things. And these gods are powerful, super powerful. They can really screw up your life, but they're also, they can be really evil. They're like, you know, human beings with lots of power, right? I.e. Marvel, right? Whatever, right? So the, the human beings, and they just get tons of power, and they can be good. They can do something good in your life, but they can also just screw up your life because you, you can get raped by them. You can get pillaged by them. You can get killed by them. You can have your crops crushed by them, right? You can lose a baby because of them. And so everyday life was about negotiating this world with all these powerful forces, and you were offering a sacrifice to this one, you were giving thank offerings to that one, you were going to the temple to go through rituals here, and all that you were trying to say, you know, hey, I'm good, don't mess up my life, and hey, right, could you send some good things my way, right? But alongside of all of that was the idea that, okay, so I'm in this place, all these gods are doing their own thing, and i got to figure out how to stay out of their way. Maybe I can ingratiate them a little bit to myself. Well, the other thing is, how can I get control over certain areas of my life that are really important to me? Well, that was magic. And so what you would do is you'd go down to the marketplace, and there would be your local witch or warlock setting up in the agora. That's what's pictured here. And you would go down and buy all the magical implements from them that you would need to cast a spell to get something that you want. And basically what you would need from them is the spell, the wording. You would need the implements necessary to make the spell effective, you know, like, like the hair of a black ox or the blood of a frog, right? Or a little lead lamula, a little piece of lead that you could fold up and make an amulet so you could put the, the, the black hair of the ox and the blood of the frog in that little piece of lead, folded up on four corners and wear it around your neck, right? So you got it around your neck, you got the spell, but the key thing was getting the name, the anima is the Greek term, the name of the demon or the spirit being 
because you needed to have his name. So when you said the name within the spell with your amulet on, you could bring that being under your control and then task them to do what you wanted them to do. Right? And any of you that remember the old kids' um, uh, rhyme of Rumpelstiltskin, right? The whole story is about getting Rumpelstiltskin's name. And once you got his name, then you can make him make all the gold that you want to, right? Well, the same in the ancient world. And so you went down there. And this is why um, you're going to find that as the, um, the seven sons of Sceva, they go around and hear Paul and they process him just like he's a magician or a sorcerer. And he keeps doing things in the name of Jesus Christ, Jesus Christos. And they think, whoa, that is one powerful name. And so they try to employ the name of Jesus Christ in one of their exorcisms. They get called in, you know, Sceva and Sons, you know, Exorcists Incorporated, right? So they get called in, right? They drive up in their Scooby-Doo van, right? And they're coming over and they're going to cast out the demons in this person. And they say, in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, we command you to come out. And, and the demon speaks up and goes, well, I know Paul and I know Jesus, but I don't know who you are and thrashes the guys. Right? They all go running out, and then the city hears about what happened, and it says the name of Jesus was held in high honor. Right? And as I've told you before, he, Paul's not referring to, Luke is not referring to a mass revival where everybody becomes a Christian. He's referring to the fact that all of a sudden Jesus' name in Ephesus became the Lord Voldemort of its day, the name which will not be named. And you better be a pretty, full, pretty powerful magician if you're going to mess with that name. Are you Paul? Or in our parlance, are you Harry Potter? Well, then don't mess with that name, right? And that's the whole, that's the whole idea, right? You, you, if you don't mess with that name, because that's one powerful name. Now, what happened among the Christians is what's key. And I want you to look here. Come down with me to, um, um, oh, I lost my little spot here. Uh, verse 17. When this became known to the Jews and Greeks living in Ephesus, they were all seized with fear, and the name of the Lord Jesus was held in high honor. And many of those who believed now came and openly confessed what they had done. Right? So these are, these are believers who now are coming to get rid of the magic spells that they've still held on to. And a number who had practiced sorcery brought their scrolls together and burned them publicly. And when they calculated the value of the scrolls, the total came to 50,000 drachmas, 50,000 days wages worth. A drachma was a day's wage. So there was a ton because this was the way that people looked to find help and deliverance for the things that they wanted. And I know I've mentioned this before, but the primary spell that you find that people wanted were love spells. Because if you could have any control over something, you would want to control the person you can marry. Right? But as I've told you before, those love spells were dark, dark, dark. Right? Those love spells were like, I spotted Rana down on the Agora corner, right? And I said, I got to have her. So I go over to the warlock there and I buy my spell. And I get the spell, I get all the implements. I go out to the northwest corner of my property and I'm going to cast a spell on Rana to guarantee that she's going to marry me. And so to go something like this, I adjure you, meaning I call attention this spirit being, I call you to attention. Then I would say the name of the spirit and I would bind him so that he could do what I wanted him to do. And then I say, I, I, I want you to cause Rana to fall in love with me and me alone. And if she falls in love with anyone else, may she fall down and her bowels burst asunder and she die a horrible death. Right? Now, that's, that's the way the people lived every day. If you've ever been to Haiti, you've seen that. If you've ever been to, to Western Africa, if you've ever been to South America, if you've ever been to Eastern Europe, you'll see that in spades. Right? And one of the things we, we want to mention here is that Paul doesn't address the problem by saying there is no Satan, there are no demons. Okay, people, stop it. It's not what he says. He says they're real, but in Christ, you need not fear them, right? So this is what we want to talk about here. So the, the back drop then is what you have is a group of people that they, they, have, they believed in the spirit world and experienced its activity. The people lived in fear, and anyone could manage, they believed, the threats if you just had the right tools. If you get it. So Paul wants to say you don't have a need for magic and the God that you know because of his good greatness. He's going to portray God for who he is and his purposes. He's going to elaborate on the implications for their life, and he's going to pray for their ability to live into these new truths. This is so crucial for us at the moment. Because even though many of us have been raised in the church, 
when we walk out, we let Facebook, Twitter, news, the culture, reimagine the world for us in a way that's contra the way God imagines it. And we need God's help to live into the truth that really you, you know, I sang that today. I'm a child of God. And you know, it finally hit me today. I don't know how many times I've sung that song about how to, to really say that last phrase. Right? I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. I saw that. Yes, I am. I don't know if Sarah saw that today, but I was, yes, I am and up there, right? Well, how do you imagine yourself to get today? You know, I'm, I'm a person who's made so many poor choices in my life. I'm a wreck and a loser. I don't look like an Instagram-worthy person. I must not be very valuable. How do I get a little piece of that popularity? What kind of, what kind of ugly thing or infamous thing do I need to do to get somebody to pay attention to me? I got to get out there. I got to get my name out there. Right? I don't have somebody who loves me. Right? What do I have to do to get somebody to validate that I'm worth something? I need a guy to tell me that I matter. I need a girl to tell me I'm not a loser. Right? And we have all of that every day. And every day, God said, no, no, you're, you're imagining the world wrong. You're seeing the world wrong. You're, you're my son. You're my daughter. You're inestimably valuable. You're, you're my inheritance. I'm going to take you out of the world. I'm going to spend eternity lavishing my love on you. I'm going to bring you into the life that I created you for. And here's everything that I've done. Here's your new people. Don't let those people tell you that those are the people who matter, right, in terms of their opinion and how they go. Here's your people. Here's your mission. Here's who you are. But every day you walk out the door and people say, that's not who you are. That's not what matters. That's not important. That the character that God's trying to inform, form in you is more important than the bodily appearance of you outwardly, right? You're not your body, but you are. Your body has a lot to say about you, but your body doesn't confer value on you based on how it's configured. It doesn't lock you into a personal identity because of what color it is. It doesn't keep you in some sort of group. Okay, you're either, as Paul is going to say, you're either in Adam, you're either living as a, a human being in rebellion against God, or you're a person that's being reclaimed in Christ. And who are you, right? So they live in that, and Paul is wanting to help them reimagine it. Now here, I'm gonna, you got help. If you look to your little uh, out, uh, your booklet, this is here. I, I definitely got to figure out what's going on here, because I can't hardly read that. Can you hardly read that? All right, okay, you're affirming that terrible job I did today. Thank you. All right, I just can't, I can't read it very well, and I know if I can't read it, I'm sure you can't, so it, it's exactly what I intended for you not to be able to see what's up there. Okay, uh, well, come, just open right to the very first page, and you'll see it says, uh, getting the big picture. Can you see that there, getting the big picture? All right, this is also large for you to read that there. All right. I just wanted to give you just a quick overview of what, what, the, what the book is about, and I've highlighted, at least you can see that there in black, uh, over against the white that's there, is that the first three chapters are all about God's big plan, right? And if, you, and if you look at that, if you're reading through the book, one of the things that it describes is one of the ways you know it's about God's big plan because it's descriptive. It keeps telling you about what God has done. It tells you about who we are. It tells you about His purposes. And what it doesn't do is it doesn't give us any commands to do something, which is kind of interesting. So if you're thinking about, Paul's going to spend three chapters, and he starts off with about how God's big plan in Christ by the Spirit to re, re, uh, restore and reclaim everything. Right? He's after this big plan that isn't just saving you from your sins, but it's drawing you into his mission, but his mission involves not only bringing you to himself, it involves bringing us to each other as his people, and it involves setting us on mission together and individually into the world as we wait for Christ to finish, right? So it's a huge plan. It's way bigger, right? And, and number one, it just the thing here is this God is huge, but thank God he's good, He's not just a powerful God, he's a good God. And in the first century, it's like, wait a minute, I know gods are powerful, but you're telling me that this is a good God who actually is exercising his power for my blessing? And the answer is yes, right? 
And that needs to resonate through all of us in the difficult times, in the suffering, in the rejections, in the abandonments, in the frustrations, in the bad diagnoses. This God's big enough, and He's on a mission that's going to reclaim and restore everything, and He's proved His ability to do that in Christ. Christ came, and He made it possible. And now, by the power of the Spirit, He's making what Christ made possible effective in the lives of people everywhere. And that's who He is. And not only has He done that, but He's intervened in the world in such a way that the old cosmic powers, the evil one and His minions, they don't pose a threat to you anymore if you clothe yourself with Jesus. So Paul lays a big plan. So this sovereign plan he lays out in the beginning in chapter 1, it's just this big overview. And when we come to chapter 1, it's just a big praise song. Praise be to God, and it just recites all the blessings that we have in Christ. Then he goes to a prayer for our ability by the Spirit to actually live into that truth, to be able to walk out every day and imagine the world and ourselves as living in that story. Every day. I am the husband of Rana. Okay? I am the dad of four girls, and now I have four sons have been added in there, and I have four grandsons. I, I, those are all roles that I played, but deep underneath that, I, I'm a person who's been created by God, who walked away from Him, who by God's grace has been brought back into newness of life, and I am redeemed, and His son, and I'm on a trajectory, and he, that He wants to grow me. He's given me the Holy Spirit as a marker to say, you belong to me, Greg, and it's a down payment on everything I'm going to give you. And so when you walk out today, don't talk to me about your wife behaving in such a way that, that justifies you behaving like an idiot. No, you're my son and dude with all the power that I've given you in Christ. You go out and live that way today. Stop giving your wife the power to, to, to justify you being an idiot. If you're looking at me and the power that I have you, you should be treating her differently than the way you are right now. Okay, God, but you don't understand. You don't have my wife. Okay. I mean, all that kind of, so we, we get the, so it's a, the big picture is the one where you're sitting back and you're just going like, man, it's big. Because, you know, the famous book, for many of us right now, our problems are really big and our God is super small. God, you're not big enough for me to love this man. You're not big enough for me to, to undergo this type of suffering. God, you're not big enough for me to sustain this difficulty. I guess I figure out myself, right? Or everybody else is recommending that I, that I use this drug or I go this direction or I bail on my husband or wife or that I, do, I speak this way. That's the way you get ahead, right? Maybe get the, the squeaky wheel gets the oil. Or maybe I should just be you know, rancorous and, and nasty like everyone else because that's the way you get ahead, right? That's what you have to do. God said, no, no, you got a small vision of me and you got a big vision of your problem, right? So he starts off with that. We need to get it, live into that. Then he starts to break it down in its details, right? Individuals brought to him, a church that he's going to develop, and this is a, a dramatic thing, a church of Jews and Gentiles, people who hate each other, are going to become brothers and sisters. And then he's going to talk about how his, even his imprisonment doesn't stop it, and then he's going to wind up with another prayer that says, oh, God, help them. Help them to live into the fact that they have been loved by Jesus, and loved by Jesus, right? Now, I, I put this up here just as an overview. He begins with God's gracious free plan in Christ by the Spirit that goes toward individual believers transformed and adopted in Christ, and then he brings them into a people that are Jew and Gentile into a new humanity, and then he's going to have that victory that's going to extend to the spiritual realms and to the cause and to this material realm, right? Where does the biblical storyline end with a new heavens and a new earth, right? Not with you flying around in a robe tweaking a harp, right? Not with you coming up before Gator, you know, uh, Peter's, you know, judgment seat and letting see if he's going to let you in. No, you're going to come as we sang today before the presence of Christ as a restored person brought into your identity fully free from all the things that have plagued you in a sinful world and free from a world that is marked by the effects of human rebellion. Right? That's where we're heading. That's a big plan. Right? 
And as uh, Jesus said, right, the meek will inherit the earth, he was not using hyperbole. Yeah, we're going to do really well. No, 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 no. No, it's all mine. And one day, as my kids, you're going to get to enjoy all that's mine. Right? So, Lord, here. And then the last part, right? The, this, the key verse here in Ephesians 1, 9, and 10 is looking at, he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment. Key phrase here, to bring unity to all things in heaven and earth under Christ. Okay? Now, if you get to the end of the book of Ephesians and you think that somehow you can get your life righted or you can get righted with God, by any other way than going through Jesus, you have not read the book of Ephesians. Okay? You can't read it. Now, the last part, right, to overview it, is the practical implications then. Given who we are, given what God has done, given what he's up to, well, then how should we live? And so he's going to give, I'll call it the constitution and call in chapter 4, Christ's new people, a unity and diversity in Christ, and then the kind of the passions and practices of God's new people. And then he's going to talk about the posture of us as people who put on the full armor of God and do battle, right? And we talk about here that even though God has triumphed, right, D-Day has happened, we're still waiting for the ultimate victory. And the evil one and the forces there and the darkness in our own souls, it still has its last gasp. And today we're in a battle, right? So you're in a battle against envy today and lust today and greed and pride. Right? And we're all, we're all struggling with it. Right? We've, we've struggled with it this morning. We're all in that battle today. One day, we won't have to battle that way. But today, we need to put the armor on. And if you're not armed, right, if you woke up this morning and you didn't consult Christ, you didn't look to that, if you didn't get reminded of the battle that you're in, you might have gotten already tricked by the methodeus of the evil one, by the wiles of the evil one. Because you just weren't prepared for it. And your wife said something to you when you're on your way out and you snapped at her. Your kid came up there, and, you know, kids are always most compliant on Sunday morning, right? Sunday morning, they always behave the best. Family life is just angelic on Sunday morning. I don't know what it is. It was always the sweetest time in our family, right? I just love to see that family pull up, you know, with all the grim faces, and then everybody leave a different door and not walk with each other on the way in. Amen, right? So, all, you know, all those kind of things like that. And you, you weren't prepared for that today, and that going away has always happened. And you, you went up, and then you got to go clean it up this afternoon. And you're thinking, well, ah, I wasn't prepared for that. Well, if you're understanding the world in which you live, you need to be prepared that, that there's stuff in you that you can be surprised is going to happen and that you're liable to start off in a day and wind up in a place that you never thought you were going to be in and that you're utterly dependent on Jesus because you can forget who you are, who he is, and what really matters. All right? So as we come here, God's plan God's plan to bring all things to their appointed end for the praise of the glory in Christ through the Spirit. So Paul wants to relate this universe-encompassing scale of the salvation plan that God is working to the experience of believers as individuals and community. They need to get just who God is, what he has been up to in Christ through the Spirit, so that they can be freed from their fears and free to enjoy and proclaim God's triumph in Christ by the Spirit. That's what we want to walk through as we work through it. And I want to, you'll see, and Van's going to come talk about that. Van, why don't you come on up? Is as we walk through that, we're going to follow Paul's advice all the way through. And this is something that my dad shared with me, I think, the first time I started to read my Bible on my own. Is Paul makes it pretty clear that you're in a spiritual struggle. And let me just prepare you. If you determined to study the book of Ephesians seriously throughout the fall, you will be under attack. Okay, let me just, let me just prepare you. You will be under attack. You, it'll be amazing how many times you'll be distracted from sitting down with your Bible and reading it. It will be amazing how many things go wrong. Right? And so I, I'm going to prepare you. And so what we, we need to pray, Right? And it's interesting, Paul doesn't pray, and this is something we're going to come back to, he doesn't pray to bind spirits. That's how pagan magicians prayed. And I know that may be controversial, but he doesn't pray to bind spirits. He prays to God to reveal to him more of the glories of the love of Jesus 
so that he would be so enamored with Jesus that he could immediately recognize the falsehoods, the deceptions of the evil one. And I, I, wanna, I want you to encourage you as you work, walk through it, begin with a word of prayer every time you sit down. Ask for God to reveal Christ to you in those pages, to reveal your identity, his goodness, his greatness. Ask him to do that and prepare yourself. And Lord, pray as Jesus prayed, Lord, deliver me from the evil one today. Man, come, come talk to us about how we're going to go after that time after time.